Hi, everybody, and welcome to The Root Causes of Mental Health, where we explore the hidden root causes of mental health problems and how to identify and treat them. I'm your host, Dr. Bruce Kerr, the founder of Atomic Psychiatry. And today's guest is a true pioneer in the evidence-based treatment of executive functioning, ADHD, and other learning problems in children and adolescents. She is also a highly accomplished attorney and entrepreneur, and it was with great pleasure that I introduced my colleague and my friend, Wendy Weinberger. Wendy is the president and co-founder of Illuminos, a passion project born from her experiences with numerous family members struggling with ADHD and other learning differences. As a result of this passion, she and her cousin Evan have created an evidence-based academic coaching business based on scientifically proven methods. Wendy also has a big heart for numerous children's causes and has raised more than $625,000 for Children's Hospital. She received her law degree from Georgetown University Law Center and spent 25 years as an attorney, general counsel, and chief operating officer of publicly traded companies. Wow. What a set of accomplishments. Welcome, Wendy. I'm so grateful for you joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to get together with you and talk about what we love and what we're passionate about. And it's nice just to see you again. Well, let's launch in. I've compiled a list of questions that our parents have sent us knowing that I'd be meeting with you today. And these parents are worried about their children who are struggling to learn. So to begin with, I think it would help our audience to know what are executive functioning problems and how might they relate to ADHD? What do you think about that? Sure. So executive functioning challenges show up in all kids that actually have ADHD, but not all kids with learning differences have executive functioning challenges. You know, for most students, executive functioning, you will see it affect them in their schoolwork and the way they go about getting things completed at home. But what's really important to understand is executive functioning operates kind of like the air traffic controller at an airport. It's the central, as you know, frontal lobe position in the brain. And it really is the conductor who tells all the different planes to be in different places at different times and manage who's landing and manage who's run, driving across the uh, landing path of another plane and hopefully not and moving around. And so just like that in a student, the student is really trying to manage everything that's going on in their world. And sometimes it becomes a big challenge to be able to hold all of that, work with it and, and keep it all in a place that really we can act upon and be productive with our processes and especially with the accomplishment of going through school and managing all the tasks that school requires. Then layer upon it the chores and the expectations of things at home, as well as any outside clubs or sports or activities. It's a lot for the kids to manage all themselves when they have an underdeveloped lobe as it is. And then on top of it, they have executive function challenges. Thank you. That's a really elegant way of presenting it. So it's also a uh, challenge to organize and plan and follow through. Do you think that's getting harder? Do you think there's certain societal or educational forces or factors at play that are making that more challenging as time goes on? Or is it something that's been stable since you and Evan started Illuminos? So I think that the core of executive functioning challenges, which, as you mentioned, you know, include organizing material, knowing where to find it, managing your time, you know, really knowing how to estimate time, block your time, as well as interpret information, use what I like to say is working memory or the whiteboard in the space of the brain, being able to capture things on that whiteboard before it gets erased and moving it into long-term memory. There's a lot to executive functioning. I think there's a higher diagnosis rate, not necessarily since Evan and I started, but in the past 20 years, for sure, there has been, I think, a, a much better look into kids to understand what's going on. And a lot of times, Maybe it's not an ADHD or a significant fill in a bucket, check the box kind of diagnosis, but instead these are skills that a lot of kids have to learn. You're not born with these skills. You really have to become proficient at them, practice them. It's just like any muscle when you're learning sports, you learn how to do something, you have to build that muscle memory. And then from there, you want to be able to really be able to do those things in sort of an automated fashion, whether it's shooting a basketball, 
properly or hitting a baseball or even doing um, a run, a long run and, and pacing that out. And so I don't think that there's more challenges. I think that more has been identified for kids to work with. And there's really more resources for kids to have to improve these executive functions. Even if they, they weren't ever called executive functions in the past, a lot of times, you know, they were called the life skills, the things that get you through school, get you through work, et cetera. So generally, society, educators, and parents, you think, are becoming more aware of being attuned to their kids around executive function issues. And then what are your thoughts around early identification, right? So we want our parents to have, you know, the radar out there, right, looking for all of this. You know, at what age might a parent start getting help for their child, you know, once having identified this and, and are there, you know, certain advantages, let's say, of trying to get help earlier? Sure. So I have a couple of thoughts on this. I think that parents helping their children at a young age, so even your little ones, teaching them just the processes of if you take something out and you clean it up, you need to, where does it go every time? Like building those routines of going right away from taking things out, playing with them, putting them away. And even just being more independent, expecting things of their little ones that maybe, you know, always a nanny or always a parent would be doing, would be running after them and cleaning up things. And I think that starting to build those new neuro pathways in the brain where things can be connected, where you need to do things in a step-like process to get to the end of them, you can start really early. I don't know that intervention is necessary, you know, in those really early phases. I just think that parents working with kids to understand that there are processes to go through in order to get from the beginning to the end of whatever it is that they're working on can help. And then as kids start to, you know, get into preschool and kindergarten, I think a lot of teachers are really, have come a long way in the fact that they do understand what kids need to be doing, what's expected at those ages that looks like an executive function. Again, executive function is a newer definition in you know the past 20, 25 years for those of us who aren't psychiatrists and, and into deep research in psychology. I know you guys have had it for a longer time, but it really was sort of just those general skills. And helping kids to be able to do those things on their own starts to allow them to work on what they're trying to accomplish and get there. As they get up further in age in elementary school, you know, I think at that point, teachers are also good identifiers, but also if there's other things going on with a child to go and talk to your pediatrician to really seek that intervention in other places where there might be data that can show you what the normal range of what a child can do at a certain point. And are you on that normal range? Are you outside of that normal range on either direction so that you can seek to get the help? And I want to come back a little later to some of the early identifiers that parents might look for when a child may have executive dysfunction. You know, Wendy, the way we think about it, when you talk about those connections between the neurons, right? And neurons communicate across a synapse. And so when we think about it, we also think about some of the genetics okay. around certain genetic vulnerabilities that can predispose to executive dysfunction problems in children. So for example, there's a gene called COMT, C-O-M-T, catecholomethyltransferase. And the COMT gene makes an enzyme that breaks down dopamine and norepinephrine. And when you have too much of this enzyme, it's what we call the COMT val val genetic variation. You're chewing up and breaking down that dopamine and norepinephrine much more rapidly inside that brain when you have a COMT val med or met met. And so what we see in, in these children is they do have a genetic predisposition to executive dysfunction problems with ADHD because they just can't mobilize enough of that dopamine and norepinephrine to have good executive functioning. The, the other one we think a lot about is the BDNF gene, brain-derived neurotrophic factor gene. So BDNF we think of as the fertilizer in the brain. It's sort of like fertilizer in your garden. This time of year, it's springtime. Everything is growing and flourishing in our gardens, right? And it'll do even more of that if we fertilize the plants. Same thing in the brain. If we have more of this BDNF protein creating more of those synaptic connections. And even we're growing new neurons at a more rapid rate. So these are some things we think about. I know as you and I work together with parents and kids, we try to look at this sort of combined approach. The way I think about the kind of services that you and Evan and your team provide is I think of them as part of this epigenome, right? We think of the epigenome. It's anything that 
influences the genome in a positive or negative way, either turning on or turning off genes. And I have no doubt in my mind the kind of services that you all provide at Illuminos really helps these genes and others be expressed more favorably for these kids to have a better chance at developing good executive function, including the kind of autonomy building activities that you're describing with parents encouraging even the little ones to get more involved in what can build those synaptic connections through taking on some of the executive functioning skills. So what do you think a parent might look for? Let's say they have a preschooler or a child in uh, nursery school or, or, or kindergarten, first grade. What do you think parents would be looking for to kind of try to identify some of these early signs of executive dysfunction or, or ADHD? Sure, I'll share those, but I have a question back at you for when I'm done. I'm really interested in whether or not you can test actually that in what's going on in the brain with those chemicals, with the turning things on and off. Is that something that you can test in a child to help understand that there is a predisposition and is there actually medicine, food, diet, like tell me what else there is to help those things. So I'll answer your question. You can think about that, but I'm going to hit you back on that question. So you can look at your kids. If, if they are going to preschool and you're not doing everything for them, or even if they're in early elementary, you know, are they able to get up and do the few things that they need to do in the house to get out the door? Can they remember to get up and pull up their sheets and make their bed look a little nice and to put on their clothes and to go in and brush their teeth? wash their faces and wash their hands, come down for breakfast, eat breakfast and get out the door without you screaming. Don't forget this. Don't forget that. Are you down here yet? We need to go. We need to go. You know, those kinds of things can be indicative of a challenge. Are kids forgetting things? They go to a play at a friend's house and they're always forgetting a coat or their shoes or a sweater or a toy, like a favorite thing they sleep with, but they forgot it. Are you seeing your child leave behind things that matter to them? And even though they matter, they don't seem to grab them to get back home. Those are all indicators early on if a child may have some of these challenges. Really understanding if they can remember things in the middle of some things. Tell them, say you've asked them to do a five-step thing. Can you go into the kitchen and get mommy a fork and a napkin and a glass and bring it over to me and we're gonna help set the table and I'm gonna teach you where things go. And the child goes in the kitchen and they walk over to a drawer and they go, wait, can you remind me? What is it that you wanted me to get you? Or wait, mom, I got you a fork, but I don't remember why we're doing this or what else I need. So those are really early onset things. Were you asking about those early onset things or did you want me to go more into like elementary school or middle school? Well, no, I, I want to get to that. But I think if we could just take a moment and empathize with both the child and the parent in the situation you just described, right? Oh, I can definitely do that because I have kids with ADHD. And as you mentioned in the intro, my whole family Pretty much all the boys have ADHDs. What's it like for you and for the child to go through that? There's two different sides to it. It's very frustrating for me because I have to repeat myself over and over. And it's a time suck in the morning or the evening. But it's also really frustrating for my child who wants to be able to remember. I mean, at this point, I have kids in ninth and 10th grade, both with a diagnosis of ADHD. And, you know, it's challenging. They're completely different kids. One is really independent. They're actually both independent in different ways. But, you know, it's frustrating when a child comes home and like, don't ask me about my homework. I have it done. I know what I'm doing. And then the next day I get a note. Something wasn't handed in, you know, or my other one. Hey, we have to leave for school and you have a half an hour. Hey, it's 20 minutes. Hey, it's five minutes. We have to go. Well, hold on. I'm just getting out of bed. You know, I mean, it's, have you eaten all those things? So it's really frustrating from both sides. And as a parent, you want the best for your kids and you don't want them to feel frustrated and you want them to feel supported and capable. And sometimes, you know, parents, I feel I even get calls from parents where it's just, I don't know what to do. I feel like a bad parent. I'm, I'm not sure how to properly support my child. What can I do to help them? I want them to flourish. And I feel like I've tried everything. So there are a lot of emotions that go together when you have yeah. these challenges in a household. And there are resources. And I just want to jump in because I love to provide parents resources. You know, there are wonderful parenting resources, people who can listen to you or can give you suggestions. They don't even need to meet with your child. We have folks that we work with that we love who can say, okay, this is what you're hearing from your child. Let's talk about how this impacts you and how you can react to that child. You know, there really are resources out there. There are resources for the kids. So I'm a big encourager. I always obviously suggest folks go to your team because I feel like you can look at them holistically and figure out sort of some of the things I asked about, but are there ways you can make changes in the house that are small that could really help lower these frustrations and give confidence? I think you make a really good point among many good points around the child's experience right? Because the child wants to do well. 
the child wants to do better and they start to realize that their brain may not work the same as other kids. And that starts mm -hmm. to become a source of shame and humiliation. Or let's say they're called upon in class to answer a question which they didn't even hear because their mind had wandered off or they were daydreaming or there was a lawnmower outside and the easy distractibility kicks in. And so I think it's really important that everybody recognize that it's frustrating for both the child and the parents. And to get back to answering your question about the genetics, there are two different tests that we like to use. One is by a company called Genomind, and that has the uh, COMT as well as the BDNF and other genes, and is primarily more pointed toward uh, prescription medication solutions. And then a second test by a company called Intellix DNA has a variety of different panels related to cognition and attention and anxiety and mood. And each of these panels has a subset of genes that are tested. And that is more focused on uh, nutrients and supplements as interventions. But, you know, one of the quickest ways to help a child with some of these executive function problems, or let's say as a BDNF Valmet variant, is exercise. Interesting. Okay. 24 to 48 hours, these very elegant studies of electron microscopy studies of neurons in their branches, showing within 24 to 48 hours, all these branches starting to come out of these neurons within 24 to 48 hours of exercise, connecting them to other neurons. So getting out, running around the soccer field or baseball field, or just getting out and jogging with your child or a fast walk with the dog all of which will help drive up those BDNF levels. So we know that that exercise helps, but I didn't know why. So thank you. That's very helpful. You know, we also like to think about what may be in this mental health ecosystem that we all live in, and certainly our kids add to it, the ecosystem of school. What else in the ecosystem might be at play along with executive functioning problems? You know, what other kinds of symptoms may be interfering with executive functioning. What about anxiety? Do you see that much in the kids that you all help at Illuminos? Are they anxious kids? And what do you see there? Sure. I mean, I, I hate to say this, but kids after COVID in general, there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression. And we see, I would say the majority of the kids that we see typically have anxiety along with their EF dysfunction. And the anxiety can make things so much worse. When kids get overwhelmed because they don't know where to start, that might be an executive functioning challenge, right? Because there's too much, they don't know how to plan or prioritize, what to pick, how to go about things, so they freeze. Well, you add anxiety to that and that just even gets worse because kids will freeze from the anxiety of what they anticipate from coming. You know, we have a lot of kids who really need to find methods. Either they work with third parties like a therapist on the anxiety, and then we work with that therapist in conjunction with the students to make sure that we're communicating the same things that the therapist is advising the child to do or act upon when they have those anxious feelings. But at the same time, we also need to figure out how to give kids good ways when they start to feel that anxiety to take deep breaths to remember that if they learn how to chunk things down, look at one thing at a time, don't look at the big picture, let's look at it bit by bit, that they can actually make these small baby steps of accomplishments that can actually help them with the anxiety too. Because they learn that you don't have to eat the elephant all at once. You can do it one bite at a time. And by stepping away and knowing that you can take something like a big looming test, for example, out of that, oh my God, if I don't do well on this test, you know, I'm going to fail this class. My parents are going to hate me, whatever. And then they can go to, but wait a minute. Okay. My executive function coach told me to look at what is actually on this test. Okay. Now what's on this test. And then the coach will work with them to say, okay, what is each of the topics and what are the questions that you've learned in class and really break that down. So instead of procrastinating the anxiety, bringing that procrastination result, instead they talk one step at a time in that way, we'll teach kids to, to interact with information in different ways in order to learn it. But it doesn't become this, let me push it off. Let me freeze. Let me go do something else so that I'm not facing the anxiety I'm feeling, but we absolutely work with lots of kids with the anxiety. And I think that great learning executive function skills can help the anxiety at bay when it has, is related to school. Now, obviously there's other things that, that we as executive function coaches can't help with anxiety, but we work with lots of kids that have both issues. 
Well, I think you help enormously simply at the level of engaging with the child around helping interpret their world in a way that they can feel more successful in their world. Their academic world is more manageable. When I start to think about where my mind goes with all this is, again, the work you do at Illuminos as an epigenetic modulator. So I think of a different gene that you help. So there's a different kind of COMPT variant called the MET-MET, COMPT-MET-MET. So here what happens is there's too little of the enzyme, COMT. So the child is anxious. Let's say they're in a school setting where they have a test or they have a lot of homework. They're anxious. Their frontal lobes get flooded with dopamine. And in this instance, they can't break it down. They don't have enough of that COMP. So then what happens is there's this area of the brain called the amygdala, which is the fight, flight, or freeze, right? So we all can have our amygdala hijack our frontal lobes when we feel frightened or panic-stricken or very anxious. So with these kids, if they have this comp to med med variant, the frontal lobe gets flooded with dopamine, their amygdala gets red hot. And then what happens is that drives the adrenal glands to release all this cortisol and all this adrenaline. And that can lead to anxiety. It can lead to panic attacks, school phobia. Mm. And this is where I think you all can come in by establishing, because I know because we've sent a lot of kids to you, you really can help calm that amygdala down because you have this evidence-based, scientifically proven protocol. And if you could just sort of walk our listeners through how that goes, you know, how it goes from evaluation, intervention, and all of that. And then I do want to get back to the different age groups. So maybe, I don't know how you feel about this, but maybe this is an opportunity also then to weave in, you know, what's it like for the little ones and then the middle schoolers and the high schoolers. Sure. So that's a lot. So first I was laughing because one of the things that we do with some kids, because it makes them laugh and it calms them down, is we tell them to take a deep breath, put your hands above your head, and breathe out and say, I'm calming my amygdala. <laughs> are you saying that? Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Because why? Kids are like, what are you saying? And do I have to do that? So it eases up on the anxiety up front, but it also just literally does that because if you stand up and you, you take that break and you do that, you've got a child who's relaxing their brain, disassociating with, from what they're anxious about and having a moment to really catch themselves and let that amygdala know that they're not in fight, flight, or freeze mode. So pardon my laughing, but that's... No, I love that. You're personifying the amygdala. I think that's very clever. Yes. And I think it's good for kids to understand how their bodies work too. I think that, you know, sometimes when they understand what's triggering them, it gives them validation. And then they also feel like they have more control over the situation. So, you know, obviously we work with elementary and high school and college kids and middle school too, all a, a little bit differently. But I think that one of the ways connecting to what you were saying and, and how we work with kids is that not only do we have an incredibly in-depth process of learning about the family and the student, reading all of their neuropsychs, reading anything that you've provided, reading anything that any of the teachers have provided, and then having interviews and such with the child and the parents, but we work really hard to match the right coach. So we want a coach to be matched up with a student that they can relate, first of all, so it doesn't feel like the child's done something wrong. It's really important to us for a child to understand that this is not because there's something wrong with them or they've done something to make them bad. But instead, this is really a coach who's there to be their personal cheerleader and find the tools that they need in order to be successful. And everybody learns differently. And so everybody has their own toolbox and our kids just need to figure out what are the right tools to carry around in that toolbox. And at the crux of what we do, what I believe is the foundation of what we do is building self-esteem and self-confidence so kids don't have that shame. They don't feel like, well, I'm different and I can't do X, Y, or Z. But instead, I can be just as great as Sam or Jack on either side of me. I just have to have the right tools and use those tools, self-advocate for my tools, stand up for what I need, and make sure that I integrate them into my world so that I don't have to remember them, but they just sort of happen naturally. And then I can be just as good. So you eliminate the shame problem. We have coaches that work with kids. And again, it's not just ADHD. We work with kids with all different things, comorbidity as well as individual, just you know, one-off challenges that we're helping them with. And so there's lots that go into building that confidence and self-esteem. And then the coaches have different personality types, different interests, so they could relate to the kids, bring examples in that actually relate to a student. 
Some boys love sports, sports examples. Um, integrating some things into what they're doing on their sports side can be helpful. The latest research that I've heard, and I might be a little behind at this point, I've been a little busy, but I do try to keep up on it, is that kids basically between zero and 18 years old can only focus on one thing at a time for one minute per their age. So it used to be that it was two minutes per their age, but with the internet and the devices that we've all brought into the world, everything is so instant, the kids really can't focus for that long at a time. So if you have a child who's 14 and they're focusing on one thing for anywhere from 14 to 20 to 25 minutes, you're really maxing them out at their ability to focus. And so you have to teach kids that they need to take brain breaks. They need to, like what we said with calming the amygdala, we want to calm that brain down. We want to take it out of the focus mode, let it unfocus for a few minutes. It doesn't need to be a long time. It can be to go to the bathroom. It can be to stand up and stretch. It can be to get a drink of water. It really doesn't matter, but to allow that brain to, and you can speak to the realities of what happens in that brain to allow these brain breaks and why they work so well, but they really do work well to give a kid a break and then they come back and refocus again. So the years of all these parents saying, well, if you don't study for hours and hours at a time, you know, you're not going to be successful really has become not the right way to go about things. And so we work with kids, no matter what their age on figuring out when to do these brain breaks, we work with them on understanding how they learn best. So, you know, kids who have, let's just say ADHD hyperactive, maybe they're a kid who needs to learn orally best versus reading and they need to be moving. So we've had kids that we have worked with who literally will do other things. We had a kid that was on not safe in my opinion, but one of those hydro boards in the house where those hydro boards came out and they were like going all over, the kid would ride the hydro board around during the winter and her parents had a big open space to do that. But we would talk to her about history. We would make stories out of history. We'd do things in a way that she learned best and helped her understand that by maybe having music on in the background or maybe having it not just stark white space of sound in the background, it could help her focus and learn things while also teaching at the same time that turning things that you're not so interested in into a story and doing it in a way that there's other cues around you will help you actually not only retain things longer, but be able to file them properly so that when you're asked in class to bring that information back, you have the tools to be able to do that, whether it's on a test, quiz, discussion in class, whatnot. Those basic things work through kids in elementary, middle, and high school, but the actual teaching of the way to approach it with their work, because we don't teach in the abstract, we teach very concretely, is we use the work that's in front of them, use examples, use the things that they actually interact with every day to interact, to actually um, integrate our curriculum and teaching them how to go about being organized or managing their time or how to study, how to take notes, even impression management, which is something unusual that Evan coined as a term. And we really teach kids today that I don't think is a common thing that might, people might think about with executive functioning skills, but especially as kids get older, you know, what is the impression you're leaving on your teachers? What is the impression you're leaving on your parents or your peers or your grandparents? Are you leaving an impression that says you're interested in learning? You want to learn more. You'll lean in. You're sitting at the front of the class. You're asking questions. You're going in at study hall time, et cetera. All of these things are about, you know, everyone has that's teaching has the ability to have some leeway, right? And if they think you're working really, really, really hard and they can help you to get even further, you're more likely to get a little bit more out of someone if they realize that you really are putting in the effort and the time. And so that's another thing that we work with teacher with kids. Yeah, that's great. It's almost a teaching a form of etiquette, right? And also you're sort of touching on very early on, on you know, what's your personal brand, right? How do, you, how do you want the world to see you, right? Because that also can relate to how you see yourself. It is. It absolutely is. You know, you made a very interesting point about that work recovery cycle, to build in the recovery cycle. And in a way, you, you phrase it as a question to me, how do we think about that, right? So as I think a lot of our listeners know, inside every cell are what are called mitochondria. The mitochondria, I think most people know, are power plants. They do lots of other things. They make hormones. They talk very actively with the DNA in our nucleus and help regulate how that DNA expresses itself. They've got other functions, but if we just focus on the, the power plant, the mitochondrial power plant, one of the things we know is that the brain is this huge energy consumer. So the brain weighs about 3% of the total weight of the body, but it has to produce 20, 25% of all the energy in the body because it has to consume that much energy to work because there's a lot going on up there. You've got 
100 billion neurons, 100 billion glial cells, 1,000 trillion synapses. There's really a lot going on. And so the way those mitochondria make all that happen is by producing ATP. And ATP is sort of the currency of life. And what happens is that ATP can get depleted. And there's something called ATP reserve in those mitochondria. Again, hearkening back to exercise, you know, one of the ways to improve that ATP reserve in mitochondria is through exercise, aerobic exercise. Also, that really begins to touch upon nutrition because the energy production in the mitochondria is really dependent on a lot of what we call micronutrients, which are cofactors, you know, like B vitamins, for example, or magnesium. The other thing we start to think about is the role of folates. And folate is involved in lots of complex reactions in the brain. And at one level, folate helps determine what genes are turned on and turned off through what's called methylation. And there's a gene called MTHFR. And certain variants of that gene don't produce enough neurotransmitters. So in some kids, adolescents and adults that have this variant of MTHFR, they literally, even if they took lots and lots and lots of folic acid in their diets, they lack an enzyme that converts that folate into methylfolate, and then they don't make enough neurotransmitters. Then there's a whole separate mechanism that, and I wanted to ask you about this population and whether you work with them or not. So when we think about kids on the spectrum, Mm -hmm. Not uncommonly, if you talk to Dr. Ng, who's our developmental behavioral pediatrician, he'll say to you, a lot of kids on the spectrum have comorbid anxiety, have comorbid ADHD. And one of the things that he's taught us is about 75% of the kids on the spectrum have antibodies that their immune system makes that attack folate receptors on the surface of their brain cells. So what happens is this is literally an autoimmune condition in 75% of kids on the spectrum where their adaptive immune system, their B cells, make antibodies that attack these folate receptors on the brain cells. And then the folic acid can't get in to the cell to do everything I was just talking about, folic acid does. So what he then does, what Dr. Ng does, he does this folate receptor antibody test to look for the two different antibodies. And then there is this very safe, very effective uh, medicine called leucovorin. It's a high dosage form of folinic acid, which is a form of a B yeah. vitamin that then bypasses the effect of these antibodies. It bypasses these receptors, goes right into those brain cells, and helps produce all those neurotransmitters. So these are the sorts of things we think about in trying to help enhance the brain function of these kids so then they can more effectively use the kind of services that you provide uh, at Illuminus. So what about kids uh, on the spectrum? Is that something that you help these kids at Illuminus? We do. We do. We work with lots of kids. Typically, they're high functioning. We can't work with anybody that's not verbal, typically. That's just not our wheelhouse. I do know people that can, but we work with lots of kids that have ASD and have other things too. And some kids, you know, get put round peg and square hole, get diagnosed with something, but they might have other things that are similar to other things. And so we see sometimes where there's ASD, ADHD, but not necessarily a diagnosis with the two things together on some kids who haven't been diagnosed. But we work all the time with kids with ASD. They're really not any different when it comes to building. Now, what you explained to me about new neuropathways is so fascinating to me. Now I want to have a whole conversation with you about that. Because what we're trying to do is go in and help those kids build these new neuropathways in order to build the automaticity that comes out of doing things over and over and over again. So they have better executive functioning skills and they don't have to think about doing them. So, but we've had great success with kids with ASD. They're great kids, you know, it's just like kids with other conditions where they, what you see on the outside isn't who they are on the inside and not what they want to do. So it's a matter of finding the right person to sit with them and work with them and, and really figure out what are the best tools? How are they going to approach remembering to write things down or remembering to bring things into school or figuring out how to estimate how long something's going to take or remembering to take a brain break because some of the kids have really high focus and they really want to do that science project and they don't want to stop. And how do you find the right way to say, okay, we have to eat, we have to drink, we have to go to the bathroom, we have to sleep, right? <laughs> As you know, we need all of this. And calm that amygdala. <laughs> yeah. 
and calming the amygdala too. So yeah, all of those things, but we love working with kids with all different learning differences. I mean, you talk about ASD, obviously there's a lot going on in the brain with that in particular, but we work with also dyslexia, dyscraphia, dyscalculia, things like that. And I, as you probably know, love to send the more complex kids your way because I feel like the parents could have so much insights beyond what just simple, like a simple neuropsych or psychoed testing could have in a ways that they can support their kids. And so I obviously share a lot of contact information with them and have them go your way because I just think that it's like looking at a child from the whole versus just from one half. Certain tests can show some things, but if you can change a child's diet or add some kind of chemical to their system, be a prescription, supplement, et cetera, it goes back to my empathy for kids, feel like they're functioning at their best. That's the best thing you can do for your child. And so giving the different components, whether it's executive functioning, coaching, or it's the piece that you guys provide, you know, for parents that are sitting out there going, I just don't know what to do for my child. I guess my biggest piece of advice is call one of us. You know, because we won't just look at it from our perspective. When I talk to parents, a lot of times they've just gotten a diagnosis or they've just gone in and had a test done, but they don't know what the result is going to be. And I spend long time, minimum of 45 minutes to an hour with on with every parent talking about what's going on, talking about, you know, things are expensive to do for your kids. Like, what's the best thing to do first? You know, I have people that come in that say, my kid's really depressed, but they really need this too. And I'll always tell them, if money's an issue and you can't do both, go get the depression of that first. That's the most important thing, right? You want your kid functioning and not depressed and going down that deep end. You know, same things with dyslexia and dysgraphia. You know, I don't think either of us would say, come in and do our services as a priority unless we felt that that was the best thing to do. And I feel like parents using resources like us and those you have amazing resources at your team, you know, as well that we've had on our webinars. I, I just want people to know, I want the people that are listening to know that there are people you can pick up the phone and call and ask. I'm really frustrated. I don't know what's going on with my child. Where do you suggest I go first? And it doesn't mean that you're just calling us to get our services. You know, we're, we're there because we care about kids and we're really empathetic people as it is. And obviously that's one of the reasons that when we first met, I just adored you wow. because it's so important. Well, it's true. I feel the same. Your passion is just contagious and infectious in a good way. And, and you've got such a big heart and you're really so devoted. I really just want to help kids and families. Like, I just don't believe that there were the right services for so long for these kids. And it wasn't defined, you know, and there's nothing wrong with them. Like when I say they're challenged, it doesn't mean that they can't do anything. It's just a matter of, like I said, finding that right path and where to go to first. And I think both of us come from a place of just really wanting to help the family as a whole and figuring out the way their kids can be the best and that you can show up as the best parent for your kid. We're resources for that. I just really want people listening to know that. Happy and be happy and feel good about themselves, right? And have a good life. And sure, I mean, I wish that when we were raising our kids, there were the kinds of services that you're providing now. And so I think, you know, also, if we could move now to that last age group, it's that our let's say, you know, late in their junior year of high school or in their senior year of high school. And then, you know, for a parent, the dread starts to set in about, we've built all this help and structure and support and things are going so well in high school now. And now college is coming and it's like this great abyss. You know, I'm launching my kid into this abyss and everything we create won't be there. And so... What are some thoughts you have for those parents to give them some idea, some hope for all of that? Sure. We get lots of calls like that. There's a lot of things and it's not just us. I think that getting an educational consultant to really work with you, a college counselor who understands what the needs are that your kids have um, and really understand what of those supports they're going to need in college and does the school where they're going provide it? Do you need outside resources? If it's reminding them to take prescriptions. That's something that an executive function coach can work on. When kids go up into 11th, 12th grade, the goal is for them to be way more independent. And we want to work into the system that the parents are not the scaffolding anymore, right? So what are the other independent tools that you could put in place, whether it's a reminder on your calendar or, or Apple Watch or Google Home or whatever it is, you know, finding those external ways to help a student manage the things that a parent has been helping to manage is really important. But every kid is different. And I truly believe that even having a conversation with a good college counselor to say, this is the status of my child. Do you think they need to go to a school where support services are really integrated into the education that they're getting? Or can they go to a mainstream school? And then how do I go about that? And a lot of times for the kids that are going to mainstream schools, 
It is making sure that those executive functions are set up. It is making sure that those routines are built in. It is understanding for a kid in college, it's all about their calendar, you know, and you think of it as a balloon, right? And there's a big, long balloon. And if I map out what I'm going to study all week and I'm going to go to all my classes, but then on Friday night, I get invited and I was supposed to do a project, right? And I got invited to go to some concert and that's going to be really fun. Okay, well, just because you, you just squeezed the balloon right there, which means that it went somewhere else. So you have to take your calendar and you have to, what I call swapping time. So mm -hmm. you have to find that two hours and swap it with other free time that you had built in to make sure that it's covered. And that sounds easy, but when a kid is on their own, we've all been there and the choices are especially kids with ADHD and other things that makes them want to do what they're most interested in doing. And they have to restrain and make sure that they build in the time to do the things that they don't love as much as the time is for things that they do love as much. It's really important. And having a coach who can be at college with the student, whether it's in person or virtually because they've started prior to high school and they just want to have that same person carry through, helping a kid get through their first semester is huge. They build the confidence, they learn they can do it, or they learn where they are falling down and where they need more support and what kind of changes in support can there be? And are they going and talking to the TAs of their professors to get that extra support? Or are they going to the writing center to get the support there? Or any kinds of things that just, I feel like college for a lot of kids is not being aware of the tools that are embedded for their, them to get success. And when you tour our college, you don't necessarily know what's there either. You know, my mind just went to where yours did because I'm thinking about how a parent might do due diligence around the school, right? Because what you've seen, and I know what we've seen is, even when we go through the steps, let's say, of getting the child reasonable accommodations at the college, right? Where, let's say, you know, our, our Marlena Wu does the testing and then meets the, the standards of the school and the child gets the recommended accommodations. But then... You can have these professors who just ignore, ignore it. So can you think of maybe for our audience of listeners, some questions they might ask, let's say they're going through the tour or they're corresponding with the school and let's say they feel they found a school that has resources. So what, what sorts of questions should they ask as part of their due diligence around the college? Well, I think it's important to understand if there's actually someone who's going to work with the individual professors, not just hand them a piece of paper and say, these are the accommodations, but actually understand who is in their class and who's going to take the time to understand what the accommodations mean and where they can't meet the accommodations, understand why the accommodations are there to find an alternative way to meet the need of the accommodation. So, you know, that's where a TA of a professor can be really helpful. Okay, so I can't get you maybe all of the notes prior to the class, or I can't get you annotated notes. But you know what I can do is I can get you the slides that we're going to go over, and then you can meet with the TA, and you can the TA will walk through, she'll have, or he will have what I've gone over, and then you can ask direct questions. Maybe you need to have help. A lot of kids need this. I've not talked about a lot. You go to college, you're expected to be able to manage your time so that you're assigned something on day one, and on day 30 or 40 or 60, you have to turn something in. Well, a lot of kids haven't had that in college, in high school. A lot of places in high school let kids get away with not meeting those milestones. So ask, this is something my child struggles with. Is there a way that there's someone in the support center that can help them build out that calendar, that they can go to check in, that they can sit with to make sure they understand how to accomplish that milestone before day one? You know, really understand the people side. I know that sounds a little bit silly, but understand the people side and the people factor because making the connection and helping your child feel like there is someone there who is on the other end, even if it's a Zoom, it doesn't matter, but there's a human person that can help them find the path to get what they need. That is what is so important. As you as a parent, if you don't know the systems, you're not going to be the best for your child. I think you really, really hit the nail on the head there. And thank you for that. Because what happens is, we've seen it happen, where we file for the accommodations, the accommodations are approved, but there's not that individual at mm -hmm. the school who the child can turn to. Mm -hmm. They're just kind of thrown in, and then it's up to them to try and negotiate with the professor around getting them. And you know, what kid, they're already intimidated, they're scared, they're trying to adjust to a whole new situation. And they really don't have that capacity, uh, nor should they be asked to go negotiate with the professor. That person at the university or college, they can turn to toward a resource that really, like you all provide, like your coaches provide, become a coach and an advocate for that child. We teach them how to self-advocate. Again, like everything working towards dependence. The other suggestion I would make for kids who are graduating right now, and parents have this concern, go to the school during their orientation time 
and find people on campus. Make sure your child knows who their RA is in their dorm. Make sure they know exactly where whatever support center there is and know a person there that they have a phone number and they have an email address that they can reach out to. Even if it's not the right person, it'll be someone that they connect with when they're feeling, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what step to take. And to the extent that they can meet their professors ahead of time, you know, there's a lot of professors on campus before all the students come on campus. It's not a bad idea if you really do need some extra support to talk to your dean or to talk to the person in charge of whichever college you're in, et cetera, to see if maybe you can go and have a conversation. Maybe you could just have coffee with a, a couple of professors, whatever it is, so they can make a human connection with you. To understand, it's that impression management again. It's to understand you want to be successful and you know the things that you need to be successful and you're not asking them to go way out in a, you know, from what they usually do. You're happy to work with the tools they give you, a TA, a contact at the support center, et cetera. But putting a face and a face-to-face -to -face together can make all the difference in the world in both feeling confident and knowing where to turn to when you have questions and getting the results of what you need for you to be successful. That's great. And it's so hopeful. So finally, we're just about out of time and I really do deeply appreciate your time. And I love hanging with you and I always learn something. <laughs> you have so much passion. It really is. It's wonderful to see you care so deeply. How can parents learn more about Illuminos? Oh, sure. So they can find us on the web really easily at illuminos.co. There's no M on the end of it. It's just .co, like dot .company. And they can set up a free consultation call right on their own schedule based on my availability by clicking learn more. It's really easy to do. And then we will have 45 minutes to an hour set aside to talk. You don't need to take all that time. But my goal is really to answer questions and figure out what your next best steps are. And I tell all parents this. We may not be the executive functioning coach for you. We may not have be the right thing for you for a variety of reasons. And I'm always here to give you my honest opinion about other folks, about questions to ask other companies. You know, we may be, whatever it is, I, I always feel like you have to, as a parent, feel like you're finding the right thing for your child and not everyone is gonna be the right thing for your child. Lord. And so I want people to call me as a resource talk to me about what we offer, talk about things that maybe the way your child is, well, maybe this would be better for them, or maybe they need this kind of person. Like we go in home, we also do virtual, but some kids, you know, they absolutely have to have the in-home and you need to find other resources that provide in-home that maybe are less expensive or don't require two hours a week or what, whatever it is. I am really available. Schedule that time with me. You can also call us, obviously. It's, it's really easy to reach us. It's 571 313-5163-571-313-5163. But honestly, any way you can reach us. The other thing is hello at illuminos.co. All easy things. They can also reach out to you. You can always share our information with them. Right. We have your information on our website. And vice versa. Anyone who wants you, I have your information too. And I just want to reiterate what a high integrity person you are and your organization is. And I've seen it where you'll say to a parent, well, I don't think we're the right fit but here's someone who may be, and that really is very impressive. All right, I think uh, we've covered a lot today. Any parting words for parents? Be your child's biggest advocate, and remember that just because they aren't perfect in your eyes or they're not getting straight A's, which I have a lot of dads that like to push for straight A's, it doesn't mean they're not a great child and can be as, as successful. They can be anything they want in the world. They just really need to figure out who they are and get those tools in their toolbox, and they can succeed just let them lead a little bit. Don't always push them down the path you want them to go down. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Wendy. As always, it's wonderful. I love talking with you. Likewise.